So um, basically what I'm going to share with you, we've been doing, and those are coming in from the garage, we've been doing the Truth About series. Now I like to do these because each particular lesson deals with a part of our life. Now as I was explaining to Terry earlier this morning, that when I teach according to what God lays in my heart to teach, it's in series. And it's one step at a time until we become like Jesus. So God gives precepts and precepts and lines upon line. Here a little teaching, there a little teaching until Christ be formed in us and we grow up into him. So today, in this particular briefing, we're going to talk about how God builds the new man. How God builds up the new man within you and I. Now we need to understand some principles and so as we go through this, I want to make sure I explain these principles so that we can place this word in our heart and become doers of it. Can you say amen? All right, so today we're going to look at how God builds the new man within us, how he equips us in the glorious life that we have now with Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we're wonderfully set up. In the Old Testament, they serve God by faith. But they had to deal with the enemy that wasn't bound. They had to deal with all of the things, the lies. And so they had to meet with God almost vigorously in order to get the understanding of God because they weren't born again. But you and I, on the other hand, we live in the New Testament. God has come to dwell in our hearts. We still serve him and we still follow him by faith. But you and I have a guidance system within our spirit. And, uh, you know, to amplify that, his name is God. Amen. He knows what you need of. He has everything lined out for you. That's why he gave us his word, so we can get the general idea of God dealing with man. And we have the New Testament where God walks and he talks in us. He's our God. But you see, here's the problem. Many Christians today are struggling needlessly because they think they're serving the God of the Old Testament. They, they think things like this, I want to kick over a whole bunch of sacred cows. You see, you have God dwelling on the inside of you. So it would be kind of weird to think that God takes 21 days to answer your prayer when he lives in your heart. Hello? Hello? And so what I want to try to do, and what God raised me up in these last days, and many, many, many others like us, and you too, is that a message has to be clear in the last days to get the church ready for the coming of the Lord. But we have to have clarity and understanding of who we are in Christ, how God builds us up, how we can not get in the way of God causing us to grow, how can we can flow with God and how we can cut out all this confusion, all this white noise, all this narrative mess that's designed to confuse us. And folks, let me remind you again, with all the stuff that's going around you, you have God in you. Now the key is, who are we paying attention to? Good golly. Christian, who are you paying attention to? Think about that. We have to answer that within ourselves. Never forget you are two people. You are an old person. I'm sorry. We're an old man and we're a new man. It's trying to be funny, but it's not going over good. We have the old man used to be us. And then we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted him. And we became a new creature, a new man in Christ Jesus. So we've got to remember there's two of us and they're directly opposed to one another. Your flesh wars against your spirit and your spirit against your flesh. And so that the man of God or woman of God can't do the things they wish they would do. Paul says in Romans 7 that good I want to do, I find myself not doing it. So God has to build up the new man within so we can take over all the messes that the old man wants to keep on messing up in. Can you say amen? Somebody asked me a long, long time ago, well, which one is winning? Which one, the old man or the new man? The one you feed the most. The one you give the most attention to. Oh, I don't pay attention to myself. 
That's why you're always sleeping when you need to be paying attention. Hello? Amen? So don't, don't kid yourself. We all wrestle with the idea of Cain and Abel. Now, here's something that we need to realize, that God gives us examples throughout the Scripture to relate to our walk with Him. You have a Cain, and you are an Abel. You are a Cain, and you are an Abel. Don't call me names. No, listen, your flesh is your Cain. It's like Cain doing its own thing, thinking God's going to like it, and we're going to impress God. And then our spirit is the Abel. We do it God's way because God lives in our spirit now. Can you say amen? But how we go through the day is who one we're listening to. Your flesh, which the devil seems to program, and your spirit, which is filled with God. So Christian, in this 2020, where Jesus is Lord, you see, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord in your heart. So therefore, that any problems, any frustrations we have, let Jesus take the Lordship and take the reins and he'll blast you right on through it. I want to continue to say, so we have a Cain wants to do it our way. We have an Abel that wants to do it God's way. And you know what? If we just don't do anything and don't understand that principle, we'll end up what James says as being a double-minded man. Remember what the scripture says? The double-minded man is unstable in everything he does. Why? Because he's vacillating from the old man to the new man. What God wants, what, what the flesh wants. Oh, I used to do it this way, but God wants me to do it this way. <laughs> Double-mindedness. Satan loves it. Because he knows once he gets you to flash back and forth, back and forth, back and forth like that, you'll be unproductive, unable to walk in victory, and unable to be the witness really God wants you to be. So therefore, we put to death our old man, and we feed our new man. Can you say amen? Now, there's some things that we need to be disciplined in to help our new man come into the fullness of Christ. Number one, you don't miss church. I'm going to say it again. Don't miss church. This is a training center. Not just this church. Every church that preaches Jesus Christ. But today, people don't seem to have an idea or a grasp of the value of being trained in the word. They seem to forget, and they're scooting along on what I call a bunch of generally godly information, but nothing specific about their own walks, their own understanding of who they are in Christ. So we have a generic Christianity that's out there, and people are frustrated, and they can't get things to work for them because they're not practicing true godly principles or having true Godly understanding. They're just guessing. So the Cain versus Abel. You should be able to discern as a child of God when you're in the flesh and when you're not. I can. Amen. And, and how does it feel, Bunky, when we get in the flesh? It doesn't feel good. Nobody else likes it either. So if you start to see adverse reactions from people because you're, you think you're doing good, just shut it all down and learn something new in your vocabulary, will you? Okay, let's move right on. Now catch this, all right? Auth Jesus is who? The author and the finisher of our what? So we need to be in his care as often as we can so he can continue to work on us, right? But you know, that's the place where you as a Christian must decide how valuable God is, how valuable God's word is, how valuable going to church is, because if you don't put much value on it, you will not be here, and you will have a lot of things to answer for when you get to heaven. Well, God is really that serious? Yeah. He didn't send his son to hell to take our sins, to rise again from the dead, for us to play games with Christianity. 
Yeah, it was God bearing witness. You, you understand? So I know that you are that serious people, but we need to find out how God builds the new man and how that we can back off and get out of the way so he can do it quicker and better. Can you say amen? Building better godliness in our hearts by his word and his spirit. So a couple of points I want you to consider, all right? Number one, always remember we can't save or make ourselves better. I want you to sit on that for a minute. How many know we can't save ourselves? And how many know we really try hard to make ourselves better? But how many here realize that that really doesn't really work? Who's the one in you that makes you better? So you have to talk with them throughout the day. You have to be with them throughout the day so he can bring you up out of your selfish flesh. And so the new man or woman can appear and people go, Holy smokes, what have you been doing? I can sense the presence of God all over you. Why? You've been feeding as a child of God upon the principles of what God wants you to learn, and you have been realizing that all this stuff that's going around us is a pretty big distraction, a waste of our time. I don't know about you, but I, I know that God can certainly build me into what he wants me to be quicker and faster than I can by trying to make my own effort. You see the cane in there? I'm going to work hard. I'm, uh, Lord, I'm going to pray twice as hard next week because I forgot to pray so hard this week. And we try to bet ourselves, and we just get into that. You know what happens? We get under stress. Because the only one that can make us better is God. And, you know, there's a responsibility for you and I in that. We have to meet with them. You have to lay everything aside and meet with them and say, God, operate on me. I'm tired of these aches and pains of my own poorness and my own negativity. And Lord, operate on me so I can be who you want me to be. So remember, don't think you can make yourself better without God. For we need God to dwell in us, to walk with us, and to work in us, to bring us into the image of his son. Two, what happens to us when we become born again? Folks, most folks don't realize this. When you become born again, everything Jesus went through to purchase our salvation, we went through with them metamorphically or, or as a type so when Jesus went to the cross, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're, you went to the cross with him. When Jesus was beat with a cat of nine tails, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were beat with him. Well, I wasn't. No, you need to understand that your old man goes through the understanding of what Jesus went through so God could give you the understanding of who you are now in Jesus Christ. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. And the life that I now live, I live by faith yes. in the Son of God who died and gave himself to me. Amen. See, there's no other life outside of that but we want to enjoy some steak on our plate while we wait. You can. But it doesn't do any good to be so out of order in your walk with the Lord that when you do go on a vacation, you can't sit down and rest. You can't enjoy it because you're all commemorated. Let's get you fixed. Let's get you into the Word. Let's get you to value the right things in life. God must be first. Your family is second. Your job is third, and you are last. Keep it in that order. Someone say, oh, me. <laughs> All right. So when we get born again, we go through a transformation we can't see. Now, let me explain. So we actually go through, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, everything that Jesus went through spiritually, and we become born again, and God takes out Adam's nature 
from our spirit, takes out the sinful nature from our spirit, and he takes himself and puts us by the V, by the Spirit of God, into us and mixes our spirit. Now, listen, be careful. There's some bad teaching out there. Your spirit mixes with God's spirit, and you become one new creature in Christ. So you're a God creature in Christ. And you have the right to yield to the God who lives in you to allow him to order our steps so that we can have victory in every day of our life. I don't think Jesus worried about a thing, do you? When he was here on the earth, wouldn't he say, oh, you know, you're worried about so much. Didn't he talk like that? He says, look, didn't I tell you we're going to the other side? Jesus, don't you care we perish? Let me ask you, have you ever said that to God? No, don't raise your hand. God, don't you care? I'm going through all of this. And we all do. But the idea is, of course he does. But is he asleep in your boat? Is he resting in your boat? Or does he have to get up and tell you, peace be still. Don't let the storms of life upset you. Get your eyes off of them. We're going to the other side. Folks, you're going to heaven. There's nothing in hell that will keep you from that. Satan still lies. Oh, you can lose your salvation. You can give it away to something. You can say, I don't want salvation anymore, God. And you can take that package and you can give it back to him. Okay? But only an idiot would do that. I'm going to use that word again, dear. Only a foolish person would do something like that. No one can pluck you out of God's hands. No circumstance, no depression, no frustration can keep you out of God's hands. Why? Because God lives in you. What, he jumps out of your spirit every time you do a boo-boo? No. So here how does it work. When God came in to your spirit, your spirit man became complete. Say, I'm complete, I'm complete. in my spirit. I'm not growing as a baby in my spirit, said. I'm complete in my spirit. Now, where you're growing is your soul. Your soul takes a process of learning and surrendering to learn for God to build your soul up because the battle's in the mind. Satan attacks the mind because he can't touch your spirit. You know, Satan doesn't have the, the key to go, I'm going to go right inside your spirit, and God and I are going to duke it out. Come on, Old Testament person. You're in the New Testament. Better promises. God lives in us, so let him take control. You're, you're feeling you're going through something? Let him take control. How do I do that, Pastor Kerry? Back off and pray. I don't preach myself happy. Okay, so when you get born again, you get it. You're saved. But your soul is in a process of flux. And your flesh has to be dealt with. Flesh and blood cannot go to heaven. It has to be changed. Your blood's corrupted. That's why you age. And your flesh is corrupted. That's why you get sick. Hello? Well, Christ has redeemed me from the curse. That's right, but you have to take your bod put it into the hands of God every day so he can handle that dude or that dudette. Hello. Hey, I don't, I'm in a rare more mood today, so you just pray for me. Thank you. All right, so catch this. The third thing I want to give you is Jesus wants us not to draw attention to ourselves by working so hard to be a better Christian. Do you hear me? You're not supposed to be working so hard to be a better Christian. You're supposed to be really, if you're going to work hard at anything, work hard at meeting with God regularly and stop falling asleep in services. Hello? Well, I just can't help it. Well, go to sleep at 6 o'clock on Saturday. Just joking with you. You see, we let things go in our lives so much, we don't even realize that when we're doing things, there's a lot hanging out that people shouldn't see. 
Moving right along. I don't want to meddle too much. All right, let's give you some interesting things. So when you got born again, you got the goods. But the goods has got to get up into the eyes of your understanding. It's got to get to where you understand how God does things, how you understand what's your place in the kingdom of God. You understand? And then your flesh has to get in line. But see, the enemy knows that if he can keep your mind off of the word, off of going to church, off of those things, then it's always going to have a problem because Satan is always going to suggest you to do the wrong things. React the wrong way. Woohoo! Sounds like what the enemy's been doing. But listen, that's not you. That's not you. You have almighty God living in you. It's about time we realize confidently who we are in Christ. God wants to build the new man up. And so we're going to show you how he does it. And we're going to get into that. So again, you got everything when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your spirit. Satan can't get in your spirit. So you got the goods in your spirit. First John um, uh, second chapter in First John, the third chapter says, if God lives in your spirit, then if you go by him, you will not make very many mistakes. Actually, it says you will not be led to sin because God lives inside of you. Can I ask you something? God can't sin, can he? No. God can't lie, can he? Can God get angry for out any reason? No. Can God hate somebody other than the devil and sin? No. And where does God live now? In your heart too as well as heaven. So are you letting him lead you? Are you still leading him? Think about it. Go with me to my first point in text. Okay. It's a process to build Christ in us. We get it in our spirit, but it's a process to build the principles in our, our soul. Jesus says, come unto me, all you labor, heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly, and you will find what? Rest to your souls. Satan doesn't want you to find that. Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 3 talks about there is a rest for the people of God, but many don't get that rest because they're still got themselves first and not God in them first. And so the idea of me sharing that with you is not to make you feel bad. Hopefully you've outgrown that. But, but to let you know that sometimes we're working against God and don't even realize it. So Ephesians 4, listen to this. Here's a warning that Paul gives to the Jewish disciples that have come to Christ. He says, you've not learned about Christ rightly. Hey, today, do you think there's a lot of people that misunderstand who they are in Christ?
Anyway, so the whole idea behind that is as we learn to renew our mind, God begins to build in us a picture that can't be removed from our thinking. What do you mean? Well, he said that Jesus is, is like the chief cornerstone, right? And we model all stones after him. Jesus lives in our heart, right? So we have the image of God living inside of us. But if we focus on everything else and don't focus on the word and on who lives in us, then our mind isn't influenced properly and it will take a long time to get through to us. How many know brainwashing does work? But also works for God. God wants to wash our brains with his word. Can you say it in? You are washed with the water by the word. We need to be programmed right. Amen. We need to have our mind programmed right so we don't fight against God innocently. Are you still with me? Okay, verse 23 says, And be renewed in the spirit or attitude of your mind, and that's you. See, our responsibility means put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. How many has ever got up this morning and you dressed yourself? You know what that involves? That involves thinking about what you want to wear, how you want to wear it, what makeup you want to put on, right? It took some real thought in thinking to put on all that for the day. Could you say amen? Well, the same principle works when you get up and you meet with God in the morning. You put on, you think about the Lord Jesus Christ. You put on the new man. Who is the new man? Well, how does the new man work? And you take the time to think about it so you don't go out without any pants on or your shirt on backwards. And many Christians today, that's exactly where their walk is. They're up one minute. They're down the next minute. They don't know what doctrines to believe because they're not founded in the word. And they're running out prophesying on people and doing all kinds of crazy things. And I look at that mess and I say, my golly, get back to the word. Get back to the things of God. Learn to walk in love. Stop judging one another. Can you say amen? So God has a real work in dealing to renew our mind. And he needs our partnership in it. So Galatians, listen to this. And that you put off... The, uh, put on the new man which is created in God in true righteousness and holiness. Then Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 18 says this. Paul says, now, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Literally, if you present yourself to God and God charges you up for the day, the th last thing that your flesh is going to do is rebel. Why? Because it's been zapped with God's zapper. It's been dysfunctioned. It's been unplugged. When you meet with God, he unplugs you. Don't ask me how he does it, but he unplugs your flesh. He shuts down your negativity, the bad thinking in your mind. Control your thoughts. And he does all that work on you in a matter of moments if you would spend your first of your day. Remember, God comes first with him. Then you'll walk in the spirit. Why? Because God's projecting you in the spirit. And your flesh might say one or two things. But guess what? You won't fulfill what it wants. Because you're in the spirit. Eating two pies isn't going to do it for you. I had to use some kind of wild thing there. So catch this. This I say, walk in the spirit and you should, shall not fulfill the desiring of the flesh. You'll shut it down. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. Double-mindedness. You hear me? They're contrary to one another. Okay? So we, we're renewed, right? And so, so that you may not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by your spirit, let me say it another way. If you let the God in you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, guide your steps like he said he would, your day has nothing but good waiting for you. What do you mean by that? There's plenty of bad out there. Yeah, but he teaches you to pick your feet up and step over it. 
He teaches you how to shut your mouth so you don't put your foot in it. Come on now. And he teaches us how to walk in the straight never narrow because we can't do it on our own. We can't make ourselves any better than anything else. So we rely on God. And we walk on in the spirit and our flesh just shuts down and shuts up. Now, I don't bother you. I'm all for that. Can you say amen? But it takes us willing to meet with God to do what our responsibility is. And not just assume God's going to make us come to church. God's going to make us read our Bible. God's going to make us pray. I'll tell you what will make you pray. Is when your life is falling apart and there's nothing around because you made such a bad mess of it. You will learn to pray. Why wait till we get that way? Come on. We're smarter than that. All right. Meddle with you and up. All right. But if you are led by the Spirit, he says in verse 18, you are not under the law. Does anybody here understand what the law was for? To keep it simple, and for those who will be watching, the law was to remind people you cannot save yourself. The law was written to the flesh. Shut up, sit down, and try not to impress anybody. That's what the law was saying to every good person in the world. It says, all your goodness, all your wonders, all your wonderful things, which are so wonderful because you are not born again, because you're not doing it for Jesus, amounts to absolutely nothing. Uh-oh, we better do it a different way then. Yes, Abel. Don't let the cane in your life kill you. Don't let your flesh murder you. Try to get your words together. Why is it we, let me just show you how crazy we can be. Why do we explain life by death? Oh, that's just killing me. I'm so happy. Oh, I tell you, I'm dying if I do. I'm dying if I don't. We're laced with all kinds of poison. That's why God wants your mind in the word to get that poison out of you because eventually it will take its toll and the cane of your flesh will do its best to shut you down and kill you because it's jealous of your relationship in Jesus. Well, that's good preaching whether you like it or not. It just is. It preaches well. It's the truth, folks. So here's a couple of points. Number one, when we become born again, our old man is declared dead. So stop playing with it. Listen, I buried my wife's cat years ago. I have this story. And I put it in a nice place, you know, kind of did this. Because it was a great little cat, a little fluffy. And, you know, and it died in a good old life. And it didn't suffer. And it was really good. So I buried it and everything like that. Listen, how many... Here, buried your old life. All right? If not, you better do it now. And so about a year later, I was planting some things, some tomatoes and everything, and I happened to dig it, her up. And you say, well, why did you bother to tell me that story? Because every time you bring your life up and talk about yourself, you're digging up fluffy. And it stinketh. Even in your most wonderful time without God, it stinketh. And so you might say, don't get mad at me. You might say, well, whoa. Well, right now, if you realize all that, let's start having God build us up and build the new man in us the way he wants that new man, that new woman. Can you say amen? amen. Second thing is we must not vacillate between our flesh and our spirit for any length of time because it will drain us of spiritual energy and you will look listless. Instead, you go to God, have him crucified your flesh, have him quiet your mind, and have him instruct you, order your steps, and go out into the day positively, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, knowing that the victory won, almighty God lives in you, and he has not planned for you to be defeated. 
He's planned for you to be in a success, and he's inside of you seeing. But the fact is, whether we are or not has to do how much we pay attention. So, what is the process God uses, Pastor Kerry, to transform us into the likeness of his son? I'm glad you asked that question. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were in our dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. Everyone say amen. amen. And he's raised us up together. Yes. You see, your spirit man is sitting with God in heaven as well as sitting inside of you. Can you say amen? amen. That's one of the mysteries of godliness. Yes. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places, but then God's seated with you here on earth. So stop making decisions for him. Let him make the decisions for you. It will pan out much better. He will not forget any of your family or any of the things you need because God is perfect in all his ways. See, most people don't even understand the book of Genesis. God did not start the earth in, without form and void. He made the earth perfect when he made it. It became without form and void because it's, there's a Satan in the earth here. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God doesn't have any darkness. Let me quote a scripture. In him is light. and Excuse me. He is light and in him is no darkness at all. No confusion. No starting you out of confusion like you hear this weird teaching, new age teaching. God brings life out of confusion. Well, if you're talking about your life, then that, that's fine. But God never starts with confusion. He always starts in a perfect order. Yes. See, that's why you can look at the scripture and say, oh, that doesn't line up with God being perfect. So I need to have a better understanding of that. See, that makes studying the scripture a lot of fun for you because you and God are sitting down and he's unlocking the mysteries. For you to understand so you can walk up and be confident, your God's more than enough. I love that. My first point, oh my way, put your attention on who you are in Christ, not who you were in your past. Don't dig up floppy. Okay? Listen to this. So, God, who is rich in mercy because he is great love wherewith he loved us, even when we're dead in trespasses and sins. So God's not going to give up on you when you make mistakes. Not at all. In fact, he knows that you're going to make them before you make them. And he's doing his best to try to get your attention so you don't make them. Listen to Colossians chapter 3. It says, now we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, right? In Ephesians. Listen to Colossians 3. If then, now that you're risen with Christ, desire after, seek forth those things which are above. Everyone say above. above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Yeah. Then it says set. Set your mind. Amen. In other words, have this mindset. Think this way. Set your mind on things above, right? I love it. And then he says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. See, there's where our eyes are. Okay? For you died. Everyone say, I'm a dead person. You're a zombie. No. Listen, you got God living on the outside of you, but this flesh... God considers it dead, and he doesn't want to hear from it. Remember I told you about my time of prayer with God, and he interrupted me? Yeah, listen, God will always, if you let him, interrupt you when you're about to step off the path. And I want to let you know that's so good about God. He'll warn you and warn you and warn you, and if you don't listen... Then, you know, let's we'll leave the consequences off somewhere. But he does that. Why? Because he loves us so much. 
He doesn't want us to have struggles. We will. He says, in the world, you'll have tribulations. But fear not, little flock. Now that you're in me, I've overcome the world. Amen. Let me teach you. God wants to teach us how to overcome the world. See, our eyes are not on the world, but we are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, if we are raised with Christ, we are to seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set, put your mindset on things above, not on things of the earth. Why? You died, and your life now is hidden in Christ. Say, I'm hidden in Christ, in God. Now, think about it slowly. I'm hidden in Christ. What does hide mean? That means Satan can't see you. Amen. You ever play hide and seek? Yes. I was really good at it. Because I, I really went around and found the places to hide. You know what I mean? What you don't realize is when you pray and when you ask God, God absorbs you and hides you in Christ. So Satan doesn't see you, the mealy mouth, negativity person, sleeps through service, never comes to Bible studies. And I'm picking on you because this is not the time to do that irresponsible stuff. You will suffer because of it. And I don't want you to suffer because I'm a good pastor. And I don't want you to suffer, especially if I told you so. It's hard to say something. What did you do that for? I warned you. So we got to put things in perspective. God chooses a pastor because they have the personality and the qualities to speak in behalf of God. Not everybody has that. I didn't want it. But we are all supposed to be ambassadors for Christ, aren't we? Someone who speaks in behalf of and represents thereof. Can you say amen? All right, so listen. Set your mind on things above. So here's a couple little points I want to give you. The new creature in Christ is already in the spirit realm, already hidden in Christ in God. We are raised up in Christ, in God, seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, you and I today, right at this moment, we are pursuing God, correct? That's why you're at church. You're not pursuing your friends or thinking about, you know, your, your work or your job and all these things the Gentiles seek for. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. But it goes on to say, listen to this. We to pursue God and live as a testimony of how God takes good care of us. That's our testimony. God taking good care of you? Go through it sometime. Go sit down this afternoon and say, God, I want to thank you for all, all the good things and how well you're taking care of me. And I can honestly say that everything that didn't work out in my life is something that I took care of and you had nothing to do with. Although, God, you did pull me out of that problem. Hello, that's how I talk with God. And God, you got something to deal with today. I'm a little bit frustrated because I keep seeing this, this, this. It needs to be worked on. And God will gently say to me, got your eyes on the problem. Put them on me because here's the solution. Bing, 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 bing. You see, it's our focus allowing God. Now, we need to find out what he actually does when a person gets born again, I'm building up that new man. So we're going to go to some wonderful scriptures. You might not have heard them this way before. Okay? So let's just have a little bit of fun now. How many here remember the term Beatitudes? Remember Bible college, you know? Or I, I like to switch them around once in a while and call the attitudes to be. Amen? And so Jesus sat down in, in a boat and he taught. Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? So this is where we're going to go. Take your Bible and go with me to chapter 5 of Matthew. Now I'm going to go through this, and I'm not going to stay and try to lace everything with all the things that I know. I'm just going to show you exactly what happens to a person, what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples about people and about the new creation in Christ and guaranteed, many of the people, many of his disciples didn't quite understand it, but they did after Jesus died and rose again, right? Of course, they didn't understand that Jesus was going to die, right? They thought Jesus was going to 
kick the Caesar off of the throne and take over. No, I had no idea that he had to die first. Amen? Okay. So let's look at, all right, so here's Jesus. He just got rejected by the Israelites. He's being rejected by the religious people of the day. And seeing the multitudes, verse 1, he went up into a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, the Greek says, he opened his mouth and kept repeating this teaching. Peter, blessed are the poor. James, blessed are the poor. People, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But what, what is, remember when God talked, those that really wanted to pay attention got it. And those whose minds wander and undisciplined don't get it. So that's why he spoke to parables. So catch this, though. This is the Beatitudes. This is how God builds the new creature in man. Okay? And seeing the multitude, he went up to a mountain, and his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for there he shall be comforted. Blessed are the weak, meek, excuse me, meek with an M, for they shall be inherit the earth. Six, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's you, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you, they persecute you, they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice then and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. So now we're going to show you what Jesus was imparting to his disciples and those with an ear to let them hear. He, the first thing he said is, blessed be the poor in what? Do you know what that means? How many here could use a little more understanding? When you're poor in spirit, that means you've come to the end of yourself. You're on the age, edge of suicide. Okay? That's when you have come to a point in your life where there is no hope. Then you realize there is hope. So let me give it to you in modern language. Blessed, most happy, and most confident is a person that's poor in spirit. For they realize that given to them is a kingdom because it's given to the humble and has resisted the proud. This kingdom will be given to the human spirit. So you have to come to the end of yourself so you can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for yours then becomes the kingdom of heaven. So God doesn't operate with you until we learn to come to the end of ourselves, And that brings up a query. How often as we as Christians surrender ourselves to the Lord and about four or five months later start living our own life again, not backsliding, but living our own life again. Guess what? You're going to have to come to the end of yourself. So rather than fight that day in and day out, go to God, let him silence it. What do you mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit because now you have the kingdom of God. For God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. It takes a humble person to receive the kingdom. It takes a person who's not selfish and comes to the end of their selfishness to realize there's a God. That's why it's hard for rich people to come to know the Lord because they think their money is their God. They, something breaks, they just go buy another one. Hello? So guess what? God says to the one who comes to the end of yourself, you must rely on someone else because you came to the end of yourself. God gives you the kingdom. Because who's the king of the kingdom? And who's the king that's going to live in these disciples eventually? And the second thing he says, blessed are those that what? 
mourn. Did you know mourning is a type of fasting? Blessed are those that fast and are weepy over the conditions of, a, of human people. For they shall be what? Comforted. Fear not, little flock. I will send you another comforter. His job daily is to comfort us if we will meet with him. Amen? Then it says, blessed are the what? Meek. Everyone say meek. meek. Guys, how many here now, let, just be honest, don't know what that really means. What's meekness mean? Don't be afraid. Meekness means having strength and power, but you're in control of it. I have, here's one illustration God showed me. I have new washers in my bathroom in my house. But some people don't know how to treat their washers, their little grommets there. And they always shut the water off like it's not going to shut off unless they yank it and scrack it. Now, that is not meekness. You see? Being a strong man, reaching out and being able to crush someone's hands is not meekness. That shows weakness. Meekness is having something like a horse or a stallion carry a gentle child without harm. Can be strong when it wants to be and can be gentle as a child when it wants to be. Blessed are those meek people. So they shall inherit what? Earth. Amen. Woohoo. So I think we really should ask God to keep us meek, keep us humble. Meek also means well trained. You know, I find it hard that some Christians, they think they know it all. And then when they come visit you and everything, they're looking down and seeing if you're a broken man or whatever. How dare them? You'd be glad I'm still alive. I'll be glad you're still alive. If you make it through this world following Jesus, you're a hero in my book. Can you say amen? And if you don't make it through this world and you die early, you're still a hero in God's book. Because if you love God, guess what? Passing away is no big deal. It's another step to victory. Are you with me? So don't fear death. Embrace it to the point you can die to yourself. Say amen. So a meek person is someone that's not weak, but knows how to control themselves so they don't overbear everything. Say, I got it. Amen. Amen. Okay, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. I weep. When I mention God's name, I weep. You know, if I'm in prayer, that's mourning, softness, pliableness. Then you become meek, and as you're meek, you're in control by God's spirit. And then it says, you get to the point where, blessed are you that hunger and thirst after what? For you shall be. The problem is, if you're really, really hungry, don't go to the store. Because you're going to get something to eat because you're so hungry. But folks, maybe the church of Jesus Christ is not as hungry as they think they are. Because this place should be filled. Hello? But we can't look down. We can't feel bad about that. I just want those that are watching that aren't here present. That personal presence is much better than video presence. But if I can get the word into you any way I can, I will. Amen. In this little teeny church. All right. So think about this. And then it says, so what you're thinking is God is waiting for mankind to come to a place where they become totally dependent on God. Are you there yet? Lift your hands if you're totally dependent on God. All right, we try to be. Yeah, that's good enough. Amen. So he, he strips down the old man and he gives the kingdom to the new man. Then to keep you right with God, you have to be a weepy, moaning type of person that won't let what people do get you all stirred up and all angry, but rather you're repentant. You're not outspoken and negative. But you're, you mourn over the fact that hearts are, are, people are dying and going to hell. And then blessed are the meek. 
because they have nothing to prove, but they have plenty to share. And blessed are hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's all of you. You will be filled. Then it says, once you've tanked up, see, what you don't realize is everything I said so far happens when you meet with God the first thing in the morning. Have you come to the end of yourself? Or did you say something the night before that you wish you didn't? So you meet with God, you come to the end of yourself, you weep, you mourn, you stay soft. Then you, God teaches you how to be gentle and meek. And then there's suddenly a new hunger that rises up in you, and that's a hunger for God. Then after you hit the mountaintop, now you go into ministry. What is the first thing that it says after you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're filled? First thing it says, blessed are the merciful. Folks, have you ever had other Christians get on your case and they forgot where they came from? That's why I really want to encourage Christians to not find fault with one another. Believe it or not, just if, if somebody has a terrible fault, it says you who are spiritual, restore them. But if somebody, have, we all have faults. Our job is not to look at those faults. Our job is to pray for them and encourage them because Jesus died for everybody's faults, didn't he? Don't dig up fluffy. Here we go. Now, we are to be no more children tossed to and fro, right? But how do we get tossed to and fro? We go from the flesh to the spirit, flesh to the spirit. All right. So a couple of things. So blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain well, as you sow, so shall you reap. Blessed are the, pe the pure in heart. Pure in heart comes from your prayer time with God as he builds Christ into your soul. Pure in heart means your motives are pure. You don't have a motive to con somebody. You don't have a motive to steal from somebody. You don't have a motive to draw attention to yourself. And You know, you have a motive of pure love. Hello, where you just love and you share Jesus with them despite who they may be. Because all of us are without hope, without Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? Now, the word see there has a couple meanings. The word see God means to literally see him when you go to heaven. But it also has the word perceive God. If your heart is desire for God and it's pure after him, you will perceive what God wants in your life. Hello. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Amen. So, then he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Who's the Prince of Peace? And who lives in you? So guess what? Instead of giving out what, the five steps of what people need to do to straighten out their life, how about you giving out some peace and say, you know, it's going to be all right. Just get with God. You pray about that situation. God God will love you. Now, I need to say this. There are people who won't come to church because they're bound by some kind of a, a sin or a problem. Let me say this to you. The church is only an institution to give you Jesus. So listen, if you've got a problem, maybe you're an alcoholic, maybe you have a drug problem in that area, you come to church, let the word of God deliver you. Nobody here at this particular church is going to come against you. Rather, we're going to give you peace. We're going to learn to be merciful. We're going to give you the word. Why? So that you may hear the truth for the first time and realize that there is hope for you and that you and Jesus can overcome any problem. But first, we've got to get you to a place to hear that. And folks, there's a lot of religious people out there. They're just waiting for a sinner to come into church just so they can point at them and, and pick on them. And that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about giving somebody who doesn't know the truth so they may know it and understand and know what to do. There, there's somebody watching right now. 
you're bound by heroin. You're, you fall temptation to that. And, and, and that, I'm not saying that that's right. I'm just saying the only way to overcome cigarettes, heroin, anything that's binding us is to walk on with God and know that he won't condemn you, but he'll work with you to overcome. Say amen, somebody. So I'm not justifying, you know, people doing that, nor am I going to attack them for. But I'm going to give him Jesus because he's the only one that can make our life worth living and give us hope. We're not talking about religion now. We're talking about Jesus. Let's go on. After blessed are the peacemakers, what do we have? Blessed is... Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness. Now, when I first read this when I was a youngin, long, long time ago, ago, gosh, we go through all of that work, Lord God. We're striving real hard and just to end up being persecuted. You missed the point. The point is Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, when you guys get converted, the world's going to hate you because it hated me. They're not going to want the likes of you helping people and in restoring people to who they are in Christ because the devil loves the sinner more than he loves the Lord. S people love their sin more than they love the truth. And so when somebody like you comes in and shares Jesus, you're threatening. We have an example of it running for, uh, for office. Very threatening because it was all corrupted before and now a greater than that is here. Well, Jesus is the same way. The world lies in corruption. It's swayed by evil. You and I are to be that righteous example. We're to listen to God. We're to shine for Jesus. Can you say amen? But we're not promoting ourselves. We're promoting the Lord. So, blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness sake. Let me say it the way my pastor said it to me. If the devil's not after you, then you're not doing anything for Jesus. Amen. Hello? He will leave you alone if you're religious. He will leave you alone if you don't ruffle any feathers, if you don't tell anybody anything, because he thinks he has his planet locked up. But we got news for him. There's a new army. There's a believers in the land everywhere rising up in this moment, in this hour. There's a spirit of God moving in this area. He's been moving for nearly over almost six months or so in a weird, different kind of way. God's sifting the difference between the goats and the sheep, the wheat from the tares. He's getting people ready to go home to be with the Lord and people ready for judgment. Which side are we on? You see, a lot of Christians, I've said this a lot, going to be having a sermon on it. They don't know if they're coming or going. They really don't. What do you mean? Well, the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. Right? Amen. Touch not the unclean thing. What that is talking about is once we accept Jesus Christ, we need to be trained differently. We come out from the world's ways into training in God's ways. Only to get trained to go back into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The problem is people went before they were trained. You're to come out from all the bad influences, get in and get trained by the Spirit of God. And when you e evaluate that's the most important thing in your life, you'll grow up quickly. And so we need to realize that God wants to train us. Why? Because we're going to face the God of this world, the opposition of everything that is righteous and pure. And he's going to come against us. So my pastor says, if the enemy's not harassing you, then he might have you. Check your bases. Hit a home run. The enemy doesn't have the key to your back door, but you can't lay down and let him in. 
You have to maintain your walk. All right. Romans 12, I love what it says. Verse 1 through 4. He says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Did you notice the two? See, your body, your soul, and your spirit isn't the real you. Your spirit and your soul is, but your body isn't. Hello? Think about it. You present your body. Now, who is he talking about? He's talking about you, your spirit man, you, your new creature man, takes the old slab of meat and lays it at the Lord's feet. Can you say amen? You present your bodies a living sacrifice because if you don't, you won't find out what holiness is and you won't know what's acceptable to the Lord or his perfect will because your flesh will always be fighting you. But rather go every day and have God crucify it so that the new life can rise up in you and you can present, say, Lord, the only thing I have to offer you is this stinky old piece of flesh. And God says, great, I'll take it. Because it's been in the way all your life. And we just, we just say, God, I come to you and I just want to worship you. I want to tell you how much I love you. But Lord, I present my body, this stinking fluffy. I put it on your altar, in your hands, so that you can make it worth something and get it to serve me while I'm walking for God every day of my life. Amen? But if you don't present your body, I'm going to say daily, it's going to rise up and fight you, argue with you, tell you, oh, you don't feel good. Nobody likes you anymore. I tell you how deceptive the enemy is. You can each actually hear the lies of him in your own voice in your head. Sounds just like you. You'd think it would be the devil. He'd have a rasp. No, he sounds just like you. He knows how to color his words and say, yeah, but, you know, nobody likes you there. You know, you see, and it sounds like you. So you think you're coming up with these thoughts. No, it says cast down those imaginations and every thought that exalts itself. You see, thoughts exalt themselves. Thought, thoughts exalt themselves over God. So every thought that goes against God's will and plan for your life, cast it down. You'll be walking along and suddenly some weird thought comes thrown to your mind. What do you do? Just stop. Don't stop what you're doing. Just say, I cast that down. That's not my thinking. You might be going along and some kind of little deja vu pop up. It's just something that came together that reminded you of something. And then all of a sudden, this negative thinking, you find yourself on this negative bunny trail thinking about this and that, that. You need to cast that down. That's just a trick of the enemy. Because he knows if he can get your soul to be focused on you, focused on society, focused on the world, then he's got you. He might not be able to keep you from being saved and going to heaven, but he'll keep you from having a good testimony in this life where God says, you are a witness to bear witness of my resurrection. Moving right along. So we present our body a living sacrifice, which is acceptable to God, which is what we're required to do. Verse 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world. What's the world trying to do? It's trying to push us into a satanic mold of acceptance. We got churches today, and excuse me, but we got churches, you can't tell the difference between them and the world. Otherwise, maybe they're dressed up and have a cross at the front. They're still cussing after service. They're still acting terrible. What are the kids thinking? You see, don't be religious. If you're really going to serve God, people are going to get mad at you for it. But it says, blessed are you if that happens because great is your reward. Great is your reward. For so they killed the prophets before you. Somebody says, well, 
People just treat good people really bad. Hey, have you just figured that out? Only the good die young. What? You see the whole lie in the scenario that's in the world? See, but you listen to a different trumpet. You march to a different drummer. You listen to a different scenario of narration. God gives you words of encouragement and says, you have one in me. The foundations of the world will pass away, but anyone that does my will will abide forever. Mm. And it says that you may be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may prove what is good. How many here has been tasting some good stuff from the Lord in your life? How many here found out what's acceptable a little later on in your life? You found out what God will allow for you to do and what God will not allow you to do. You start to grow up and find out that, hey, what you used to get away with, you can't get away with anymore because that's detrimental to your walk. So as you grow, you find that God is good, everything's good. Then as you grow a little more, you find out there are certain things that God doesn't like and certain things that he does. Now you become a teenager. And then finally you get to the place where you understand the perfect will of God, God's will for your life in this earth for this time. And that's exciting. That means you're terribly uh, valuable for God. God has a vision and great things inside of you. And listen, if you don't know what quite it is yet, that's the fun of learning. God is building your soul into the new man. He's stripping away your old life and giving you the kingdom. He's stripping away all your hardness of your flesh so you can mourn. He's stripping away that old life so that you can be meek. You see, we're different than every person in the world. You should be excited about it. Not feel like you have to fit in to the group. You should lead the group and not try to fit in. God raises leaders on higher principles and higher quality. Not people to just fit in. We're not a chameleon. You know what a chameleon is, don't you? Change this color wherever group they're in. There's Christians that way. They'll just tell you what you want to hear. No, no, listen. We got to get back to the word, back to our relationship with God, and let him build up the new man in us because you can't do it on your own. Everyone, do you realize now that being good is just a fable? I cannot because I'm not able. I'm going to leave it to the Lord. You see? You see? It's not that you're not going to do something or you're not being involved, but first of all, I want God's instructions so that I can work with him. Amen? He says, For I say unto you, the grace that was given to me among you, not to everyone, think yourself more highly than you ought to think. How many know that gives us balance? Amen. You see, when I come in here, I think myself less than any of you. Now you're going to say, well, you know what I think. I'm the pastor. Stop telling me what I need to think. Because you're not smart enough for that. And I'm not going to tell you what you need to think. I'm just going to biblically share with you what the Bible says. And you make the decision of whether or not you're going to do it. But I think a lot differently than I used to. In fact, I think even more differently than I did a year ago. Not that what I thought a year ago was wrong. It's just there's a lot more wisdom involved. Can you say amen? All right, a couple of points and then we'll finish. This happens when we become born again. We yoke up with God for the purpose of learning from him. You... You guys are adults. You've already spent years and years learning the wrong stuff. Hello? Some of it good, most of it not. Can God count on you to meet with him? So he can give you what you need. Because we've been saying, God, help me, help me, help me. He says, okay, what'd you do what I asked you to do? 
Oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Well, get in and pray with me first thing every morning. I don't care if your breath stinks or not. Get in there and talk to God. Guarantee your day will be so rich. Your aches and pains, your little frustrations will go away because you and God are walking through the day. Amen. Second thing was we, we need to stay close to God in this hour that we're in. This is weird times, in times. So there's no way that you and I can think we can have any sanity if we don't get together with God and get his wisdom on it. And then thirdly, eyes off the world. Eyes off of people. Eyes off yourself. Where do we put our eyes? On Jesus. He's the focal point. He's the po There's a the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is the focal point. Center point of your life. Center in on him. And finally, last scripture. Galatians 2.20. I sang a little earlier. There's a song that goes... I am crucified with Christ. But let me read it from the New King James. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. See the have been? So when you accepted Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, God considers you the old person dead. So when you talk from the old person to him, he's going, who's that, fluffy? You understand when we start moaning and complaining and stuff, we're talking from a dead man or woman. God forbid. Now, we don't realize that until later on in our Christianity, we're finding out how much of a rascal our flesh really is. I mean, no kidding. I mean, we fell a long ways in Adam. We lost everything. And Jesus says, I am the last Adam. Hook up, yoke up, get me in you. We're getting out of here. Woo! Glory to God. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My home is laid up way beyond the blue. The angels beckon me through heaven's open door. And I don't feel at home in this world anymore. See, there are people in this world, and I love them. And there are great things in this world, too. But my home, I'm not camped here. We have another place we're going. So stay close to God. Listen to him. Watch for his coming. Keep your eyes off of the wrong things and on to God. For you have been crucified with Christ. No longer it's you that lives, but Christ that's living in you. And the life you're going to live out, which you now live, will you live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. What? What? Faith that God's going to cause me to be an overcomer every day, filled with blessings, filled with good things to say, encouragement for others. Why? Because he fills me in the morning. He that seeks God early shall find him. Amen. Give ear to my words, O oh, Lord. Consider the things I think about meditations. Hearken unto the voice of my cry. Usually when we cry, it's because we're under great stress and we're under great feelings of importance. Not us feeling important, but this is an important thing. God, I'm crying out to you. For unto thee will I cry. My voice shall you hear in the morning, in the morning, in the morning. You see, meeting with God first thing. Why? Because you put him first. He puts you then first. You back him, he backs you. You love him, he already loved you. And then finishing. We're to run the race that's set before us. In every race, we compete, don't we? Read Timothy. It says that you who run the race... Compete lawfully. Compete according to the rules. Well, you've got a new set of rules now. And you're not competing in your race against anything but the devil in your flesh. The devil is not that big of a problem. He needs your flesh to listen to him. 
So your race is a competition of your spirit war, racing against your flesh for control. Hello? And that's why it says lay aside every weight. Flesh and sin. Flesh that so easily trips you up and let you run with endurance or patience the race that's set before you. Folks, I plan on living another 20 more years. That's my race. I'm in competition. I have a mealy mouth coach called my flesh, and I have a wonderful coach called my spirit. I am in competition with myself, not with anyone else. I'm not competing against you. I'm not trying to make my food better than your food. My car is better than your car. No, we're competing against the selfishness of your own flesh that tells you you can't, you can't, you can't. Miracles come in cans, not can'ts. God bless you. 